So, podcast with Jimmy Buckin for Forked Up uh, with Callum. Jimmy Buckin, skipper, fisherman, uh, supplier, award winning supplier, author, TV star, and politician. <laughs> Jimmy, welcome to Forked Up. Oh. What, what an introduction, Colin. I, I would like I would like to say failed politician because I never made it over the line. And if I'm being truth, looking at politics right now, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. So, but let's not go there. We're all about fucked up today. Thank you. How 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 that would have changed your your path? That would have it. Yeah, absolutely. And and and. And to be fair, I, I am slightly sympathetic with politicians because at the behest of democracy, you can be in a job today and you can be gone tomorrow. And that is... So to serve is one thing, and you, you have done that uh, in a different role yourself, Colin, but it, it, it just lets you see that it's great to be living in a democracy, but the one thing it doesn't give you is if you're a politician... Uh, Things can change overnight, and and you can be here to here today and gone tomorrow. But unfortunately, we need politicians, and we need good ones, and we need leaders. And maybe I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. We've kind of showed in our industry that we can be leaders, and that's what we need in further down the line to make sure that we're being taken in the right direction, that everyone is a beneficiary. But if you'd stayed at it, Jimmy, you could have got into uh, I'm a Celebrity, because that seems to be... <laughs> you could have just <laughs> ran off and jumped into that quite easily. Eh? Actually, uh, that would have been good with, viewing. With, with the greatest respect, I think eating <laughs> a goat's testicles is not the thing that would have floated my boat, if you pardon the pun. So, no, uh -huh. I'm, glad I did, I'm really glad I didn't stay at it, because my passion... As you as you're aware, is about the, the community, the, the community I've worked in, which is the fishing industry, and how lucky we are to have what we've got, and we get to, to, to work with some great produce and some great people, and that to me is is the type of person I am because I see myself probably more as a people person than anything. Yeah, I would I would I would say so. You're definitely a people person. So, if we roll right back, how did you get into fishing? Back in the 1970s, Peterhead was a bustling port. 1970s? The 1970s. Is this, is this, your, second, your, is this your second boat? <laughs> so, as a boy growing up, born in the 1960s, we were, again, if you think it was just 15 years, 20 years after the, the Second World War, so... There was a huge uh, growth in the industry because they, they were obviously trying to build up the, the country. So m modern technology in that days was modern <laughs> diesel boats. Mm -hmm. modern yeah, technology. you're good at modern technology. And the government was throwing grants at, fish, at the fishing industries, fishing communities to build the industry up. There was huge opportunity. There was no such words as sustainable and provenance and we were, our, our, our mantra at that time was pile them high and sell them cheap. That's, yeah. that's how your success was measured. And therefore, and, and the stock was there to catch. So uh, us, us successful and entrepreneurial fishermen, that's, that's what they want to do. So I was growing up in that. And, I, kind of, and it was a great way to get an introdu introduction to a career that could possibly pay you more than trying to learn a trade as a joiner or a plumber or, 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 or even serve in the forces. Were, were you first generation in it, Jimmy, or did you have family in it before? My, my, my forefathers before my father were all from the... On my father's side, in the back of the side, were all from... Ah, and that's Peter Head, so that, that's Peter Head, so that's the same person. <laughs> so, they, they were all very much... Uh, <laughs> fishing industry, even even my, my father's sisters would have been involved in the mending of the nets and such like. So, but when he came to my father, my father was all, uh, could never handle the, the fishing, not the fishing, but the seasickness. So it was not for him. So he, it kind of missed a generation with him. But I grew up with that. 
my grandfather was a fishing skipper. So my aspiration, my, my desire was that I wanted to be a fisherman, but I also wanted to be a skipper as well. So there was a double whammy. So 76, mm -hmm. I left school, no qualifications. I didn't even... I, I didn't even go to school the last few months. I mean, that's how bad it was. It's, it's, it's dreadful. It's embarrassing. But it was just how you... Because you had a job. You had a career. School was now no longer required. I had a future. Having said that, Carla, 1976, you leave school. You think you're ready to move into a man's world. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. And all of a sudden, mom's apron strings wasn't there. And you were in a man's world, a tough environment, an environment that you got no sympathy. And they brought the man out in you. And, and you thought it was really difficult at the time. Looking back on it, it was probably the, the making of you, if you know what I mean. How old were you then, Jimmy? 16. Yeah, so that's the same age. I went away to the Navy three weeks after my 16th birthday. And I was just saying to someone the other day, you know, what was quite funny was, a lot of people that I joined up with, they were on their second careers. They were 28, 29 year olds, their families, and I'm there. But I was brought up to know how to iron, know how to cook, all the all the life skills. And a lot of these guys didn't know how to do that. So it meant I could focus on all the new things I was learning in the Navy. These guys were having to learn everything, you know, and it was it's quite strange. But it's weird at 16 to have mum and dad not just there to help you give you a pat on the back or yeah. give you a packet of crisps out of the cupboard, you know, it's a different, different way. And physically, your body was not able for this rigorous, hard, long hours that you were about. So all of a sudden, you were used to being a schoolboy, and, and when you were tired, you just went to bed, and when you were hungry, you just eat, to being on a fishing boat with eight other adults. You were the junior, and you were getting all the dare I say, the shitty little jobs to do. We've all been there. Uh, yeah. And, it, 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 and there was times I questioned, is this something that I can hack? Is this, is this really what I want for the rest of my life? But you see, after about six months, it kind of started to connect and you were physically getting stronger and you were physically able to do the challenges that you were text, t set. And then you were being encouraged by your peers and all that kind Cracked up one, now here's your next one, learn how to splice. Or can, yeah. and, and even simple things like when the, 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 the real hard, hard liners were mending, repairing nets. It always made, made you stand there holding the net. And you used to think, why am I standing here? Can he could hook it on a bit of can the side of the boat? Whatever. But the fact is, he was making you stand there because you were having to watch him. And learning is learning. part of learning is watching. And discipline. Mm -hmm. So it's it's that kind of. It's not until later life you realise that the tough things that they really did to you, although at the time you thought they were mm -hmm. really tough, they were actually just learning you how to how to integrate into the, the the world of work. I think as well though, if if they'd said on you go go down to your bunk or whatever, you'd have you'd have been getting an easy an easy journey while they were all grafting. So in their eyes. It's a fair, fair world for everyone there, isn't it? You know. Yeah, and can you? You just, you just had to get on with it. But as I say, it started to grow in you. But also, Callum, the money was good. I was earning four, five, six times what someone my age on shore was was learning or earning, mm -hmm. and and that in itself, uh, cash is king. That it will be the the incentive, the driver that will make you do those things that. You absolutely hate because you know come Friday you're going to be home, you're going to land it, you're going to have a fist full of dollars, and you can you, you've you've got the world to conquer. So there was incentive mm -hmm. behind it that actually made it worthwhile. Yeah, that's important. So, and so, who was your inspiration then early on? I was seeing lots of guys, just four, five, six, guys that we all grew up with in the village of Buckinghaven, leaving school, they're four, three, four years old, and you were off to, off to sea. Within a year of them being at sea, they, 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 they would have a brand new car, and can, they had a, a lifestyle that you thought, that's for me, I like this, I like mm -hmm. this idea. So probably just my brother's friends, 
they were the ones that, that were, you were beginning to see them. That they were at the fishing, they were doing well, and and they were creating a mm -hmm. lifestyle for themselves. And I suppose that was the because, as I say, people on shore can even uh, trained uh, trained tradesmen probably mm -hmm. weren't earning what I could earn as as a junior at the fishing industry at, at, in that particular era. It was a huge growth mm -hmm. area in the in the seafood community. And also, you know, going back to then, a lot more folk ate fish, didn't they? Like, generally going and picking up fish and eating it, you know, there, there was no fear factor in it. You know, it was, it was a, a staple that was in everyone's diet. It, it, you're right. And what you also had didn't have maybe as much as you have now is the food outlets and the choice of food outlets. So if you wanted to, if you wanted a meal that was made outside the home, you either went to a restaurant or you went to a fish and chip shop, which would have primarily mm -hmm. been four main things. You probably had some of the some of the puddings, red red or white pudding. Uh, you had a chicken leg and a breast. Was I always remember the Italian fish fryer who go in and he would ask for a, a chicken supper and he would say leg and a breast, and I would say a leg, and then he would say left or right, left or right. <laughs> And I always remember that. He was an iconic guy. And, and a pie and fish and chips. So the, there wouldn't have been the choice then that, that we had. No, so so in, in essence, people eat, ate a lot of fish. We grew up with fish. It's part of our staple in yeah. the United Kingdom. But as you, as you know, the ability to expand that food offering from all parts of the world now means that there are different outlets that can supply a different service mm -hmm. and that's what we've got to compete and, with. and back at sea what you know people don't understand and respect the danger of what goes on going to sea you know it is a really dangerous environment i know from the navy you know how dangerous it is but we were going out there as a role to protect protect the country and and, and you know scooting well okay there was a wee bit of drinking and socializing involved but you guys, you're, you're preliminarily doing it, forget the money part, but you're doing it there to put food on the table for people, yeah. you know? And, and I have to say, in those early years, uh, it was quite often for someone to be lost overboard, either dragged overboard by, by the fishing gear or uh, a, a rogue wave hitting the, the, the open decks, as they were then, and someone being washed overboard. These were the the risks that were, and, and the stakes were high. Now, we are much luckier now because innovation and investment and improvement in vessel safety, vessel training, means that that is, is nothing like it used to be. But it, I, I suppose as a 16-year-old, you didn't see the dangers that you probably see now as, 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 as in your adult life or even as a parent. I mean, I would imagine my, my parents were always worried about especially when there was bad weather. And even when I was a skipper, my father and mother would always say that they would, they would be concerned about me as the skipper on the sea with a crew of men. Because again, I'm taking the risk, but I'm also taking the risk with other people's lives and families. So there yeah, was you're responsible for everyone. mix in it as well. But as I say, we, we have improved our safety safety on uh, on training and I'm proud to say that our industry is in a much better place and shape that, that, than it is, that, than what it was. But there's always room for improvement. So that was quite a politician's answer, to be honest. I asked you what was the... <laughs> I asked you what was your, your, um, your, your worst, most dangerous moment at sea and you just gave me a politician answer. Uh, Do you have? Did, were, you on a, were, you, were you on a boat that sunk or anything? I was never. I never had to be rescued. I never had to. We. I never had to don a life jacket or go into a life raft. These are all things that had happened to many of my friends and pals, but never me. But I. I suppose the one thing for me was that one night that a rogue wave hit the boat and swept all of the crew off off our feet and washed us round the deck. And it was that moment when you when you come up from this 
you, you surfaced, right? The first thing is you're grabbing up about to, to get something. And it's that when you get something you can hold on to, it quickly, very quickly dawns and you, you're still on board the boat. The next thing is once you do get your head up is to look around to see everyone else around you is on that boat. And, and, and I always remember that and I'm thinking, I could have so easily swiped the whole lot of us out of the boat. Now luckily it didn't, but it was that the power and the force and the speed that it happened. It literally, there was no warning. That's, that's what I was away to say. From my, my time in the Navy, there was never a warning. You'd be just going up and down and you'd be getting the usual golfers, you'd be corkscrewing, but then you'd get a thud. You know, it was just like unpredictable. Yeah. And the whole boat would shudder and, and yeah. there was, and that is the noise that can, of, of everything clattering in sea and water and but it, but it's but it's also that and then see as uh, in your youth you then once you see that everyone's all right and you're all absolutely sod and you can hardly lift your boots you think it's funny but I don't know if that's funny and and just the fear coming out or you're trying to yeah I think so I... in front of your your pals and your work colleagues it's that king of... I think it's a mix. It's a, it's a mix of two things. I think that's a mix of um, adrenaline. So your adrenaline's going. So you, it's it's like an embarrassment. So you're you're trying to buffer that your true feeling, you know. But it's quite a good way to 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 get things off you because we used to do that in the navy again. If something happened, you would find yourself um, cracking jokes. You know, and at, t- at times it's a bit rough and a bit cruel. But you know what? You're all sitting talking, and I think that's half the battle because nowadays people don't talk. You know, yeah, and that and, is and, and that's, just that's sharing the that, sharing that, that that moment by by trying to introduce a bit of humour makes it a, a bit more palatable. If that's a, if that's a, if you could dare say that, because inside you're you're actually shaking with with thinking that could have been yeah. simple. I could have been yeah. Two feet the other way, and I wasn't on the boat, and I was then mm-hmm. the subject of a rescue, mm-hmm. and with no life jacket and on, and with a few oil skins and boots, and hitting the cold Which... water for any length of time, you've literally probably got seconds to get that person back, or he's a goner. Mm-hmm. I had a question, and I was thinking about it for later, but I'm going to come to it now. And it was about, um, like you said, about your parents and stuff, you know, would have been worrying if there was bad weather. And I don't think folk can really appreciate actually how small some of these boats are, you know. We're not talking ferries here, you know. We're talking small vessels, you know. Okay, they're, they're, you know, they're made for that purpose, but they are small vessels. But it must have been quite difficult because, like up in Peterhead area or any of the northeast coast, when it's a rough day, you know it's a rough day, and you can, if you look out at sea, you'd be thinking, "Which a laddie," you know. Like I, I, I go on and look at the app when there's rough weather, and you see all the boats going up round Macduff and hiding round the corner and stuff, you know, and just sheltering because it's catastrophic. How did your parents deal with that? And Irene, actually, your wife. Irene was, she always kept her, she never was open about her concern about me, but but you're right. And it was always when the wind was howling and can, chimneys was, slates was coming off roofs, that she would be concerned about me. But she always knew that I had a lot of faith in the boat and I knew the boats, or at least I thought I knew the boat's limitations. And I suppose it's it, that's the comfort for her that can, I was responsible enough that I wasn't going to really take a, an unnecessary risk. Because if there really was uh, extreme weather, we would, uh, in part, either run for Lerwick or, or can find a shelter somewhere. But it, but you're right. Only the other the, the last week we had that easterly storms that that hit the northeast coast, and looking back it's people say do you miss the fishing and i said in bonny days i do because it's the hunt and gatherer <laughs> but see when you've seen the weather like it was you think mm. nah i've done the time and it, and it was great and it was a great journey but i'm at my age no it's not the place for for a, a senior statesman to be 
senior statesman in Channel One. So I think I think you, you touched something there, though, I, and I totally agree. You are definitely not a risk taker. I don't, you know, for all the years I've known you, you 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 think about things quite deeply. Um, you you wouldn't take a risk for the sake of a risk. You would weigh everything up, you know, which is probably a good reason why you're still here, you know, really, because in that, in that job you were in, risk takers are likely to get caught out, really, aren't they? I think, I think, Colin, where I was with, I never had the best boat. I had to start, I didn't get, get a boat handed me, so I had to buy uh, an older vessel. And I had to make sure that that vessel was fit for purpose for what I could do with it. What I think I always had to be aware of is then I try and compete with the guy that's got the brand new vessel because he's got the much more modern, more powerful. So it's, it's, it's knowing your own comfort zone, your own level and your own ability to deal with that. So I probably, ha- it would have been very easy to say, right, let's, let's cast off, just let, let's go. I did it one night. You're saying, what was the daft thing that you did? We were, I, I remember letting go the ropes one night. It was 50 knots because everyone else was going out. And it was the worst run out I ever had. And I always vowed for that night on, I'm not going to be like a sheep. If these guys want to go out and have the, the most unpleasant passage to sea, to get one day's fishing, then fine, crack on. But I'm going to make my own decisions from now on. So there, there, there is that moment you get that slap across the face to say, can just wisen up. And at that point, I, I run my own business to suit my ability and the ability of my boat and my crew. So you do learn, and that, that's part of learning. You learn by your mistakes. Well, actually, that was that actually was my next question. It was going to be, what was the toughest lesson you learned that actually you grew so much from it? Would that be it? Or has there been other things that you've, some real shit storms that you've hit? And it doesn't have to even be at sea. It could be in personal. It could be in the business you've got yes, now. Yes, when, go th- when you go through a bad period column, and I'm sure we all do it in business, no matter what you do, things seem to be going wrong or the tide seems to be against mm-hmm. you. And, and then you start to question yourself and then you begin to blame everything else around you. Mm-hmm. And, and we, I was going through a period that there was a lot of engine problems. I, I just bought a new boat. It kept breaking down. Uh, when we were at sea, we were doing okay, but, but it was just this consistent inconsistencies. In, in, and then when you, the revenue is not coming in, you're not investing in the fishing gear, and then you're, you're not catching as much as you should be. And so all these things were everybody else's problem, Carla. Till one day it takes the wise woman in the household to say, you know what the problem is? The problem's near the boat. The problem's near the fishing gear. The problem is you. And, she's, and this is what she said. She says, and if I was one of your crew, I wouldn't even stay with you because I have no confidence in you. And it's that light bulb moment you say, She's exactly right. I've, I'm beginning to let this get me down. I'm carrying all this burden. And it's that, and she'll not tell me how to run my boat. So it's the shoulders back, the chin up, it's ego. And, and a fresh approach. And for that day onwards, I always thought, these people are, these crew are depending on me providing a, a pay. And if I'm going to mm-hmm. do any error, my shooters my head between my shoulders and navel gazing what does that show and 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 that was the one for me no can people might laugh at it but but it actually took someone really close to me to see what was going wrong with me Mm -hmm. and it was the making of me and from there i bounced back and i've been on the bounce ever since that's 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 a really good story because, you know, it's good for Irene as well because sometimes it's the opposite of what they do. They just tell you what you want to hear, but that just feeds your ego and it doesn't fix anything, does it? Yeah. Um, so, really, she really did do you a big favour, like, as in 
personal and business and for herself to be honest you know that would uh, could it, it's a making a her too isn't it you know it's not just a one way street there you know I took the risk and I went and ordered a new, new set of fishing nets and, and from that day onwards my career I never ever looked back ever so you because you you went there with a positive mindset that this this was you knew what to do you had the right gear the right people around you and you could do it and you just went out there with that mindset and that's 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 where folk go wrong yeah. they look in the negatives all the time and they don't look for the positives you know and you need the positives in your in your foresight otherwise you just look for trouble you know instead of looking for and, you're, you're out there to look for fish and, and instead of looking for the grass over the other side of the uh, other side of the fence just concentrate on the grass that is in your side of the fence for a start and get yeah. going Nuts. and get the confidence up yeah. get the income going get stability in your crew get the repairs done that's needed done and build the business back up and that's what happened so there's a good story you've got to take it off you've got to take it off with the smooth you know you, I, I, I've said for me you're the best time you perform is when your back's against the wall. When your back's against the wall and you have to make that decision, you fly. You find another gear. You find ideas that you didn't think were there. You know, it's easy to get comfy. And it's easy to either be comfy and don't be hungry for success or it's easy to be comfy and just be down in the dumps and sad and have no aspiration, you know. And it's about trying to find... Try to find that fluffy fluffiness on every level, isn't it? You know, you don't just get to there, get up there. You know, you've got to aim high. Yeah. And the thing is, if you aim high and you only get to this high, you're still further up than you would have if you'd still just sat here doing nothing, you know, looking yeah. at everyone else's grass. So let's go to Trollerman series. So Jimmy Buckin became a, a star across everyone's television screens. When it was BBC, was it, Jimmy? BB, BBC, back in 2006. Yeah. 2006. So Jimmy was on his 50th year at sea. Uh, <laughs> so they started a <laughs> Trollerman oh. series, and you, you, you are, you know, I mean, well, not just you, there was you know, a load of the load of the guys at Peterhead and around the UK were involved, but, you know, you had quite a prominent thing because everyone was going about how uh, how slack your tongue was with your, your broad, broad, Aberdeen, uh, not Aberdonian, your broad North East accent and your, 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 your dialect. So folk couldn't understand it. So subtitles were needed, which is actually for technology now, Jimmy, you know, like social media, you'd be all right because it comes up automatic. But tell me, how did you, how did you find, how did, how did that feel and how, was it a great thing for you or did you find it difficult? No, um, I would, look, If you, we started off speaking about uh, politics and, and my, my dipping my toe into politics. That is probably the optimist, the optimistic side in me, opportunist. And when I, I have this philosophy in life that there's nothing worse than people being critical of, I knew that wouldn't happen. Like, you knew it would happen because you had already tried it? No. I, I, I get quite... Uh, irritated when people become critical of someone trying to be successful. Can the easiest thing I always say to, is to be a critic on the, uh, on an armchair. The most difficult thing in life is to get up out of your armchair and go and help the people or help someone yeah. and, and, and do better for you. So uh, when this tournament came along, there was no script. It was purely ad hoc. BBC Birmingham, of all places, sent a team of young people up to Peterhead Market to do a recce. They had decided they've been watching a program called The Deadliest Catch in Canada. And they're saying, well, why are we not making kind of real-time television and coming back uh, with, with what we do in the UK? So they sent this team up to, the, to Scotland. I happened to be landing that day. And, and as you know, I, I'm very passionate about or in the sea, and when I see visitors, I always try and make them feel welcome in North East Scotland because we've got a great story to tell. I didn't know they were from the BBC, and got chatting. We spoke about the fish, and I said, "Look, we've just landed. 
we're going to wait a half hour tea with the crew. Would you like to jump on board and meet the crew? And, and from that, that was my my first dipping of my toe into trollerman. That was back in September <laughs> of 2005. Never did I think that in can, November that year they would be back saying, well, can, we've spoken to our executive, we've got a budget to do this, we're going to be running this early in the new year. And again, they come back in, journey, in January with a tripod and a camera saying we're ready to go. And, that, and that's really how it, it kind of evolved. But very quickly, I had to help them to get safety at sea survival certificates, we had to get insurance for them. I was prepared to take them for some of my friends were saying, oh, I don't have nothing to do with TV on the boat. They're only here to see the bad things we do. And whenever good, I was seeing the opposite. I was seeing unknown world. Everyone knows about fish, but did they really know the highs and lows of catching fish and that I could take my industry into the living room of millions of people across the UK. And that is what drew me in like a magnet. I think I came across quite heavily on it though, you know. I think, you know, without dissing without dissing like our industry or your industry, you know, but there is a lot of negativity, you know, where people not so bad now, but I think back then still quite competitive. You know, folk were friends but they were always kinda <sighs> snidey. Whereas, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot closer net now. No pun intended. But you know, people do seem to get on better. It's you know they've, they're all thriving for the same thing. You know, they go on about um, fish being extinct. It'll be the fishermen that are extinct, not the fish. You know. So, tro trollerman, trollerman was definitely a great platform for the, the fishing industry for sure. You know, it was great for the northeast of Scotland. Great for you. Um, but I was thinking about this the other day because obviously the new series is just out, okay? Now, how does that make you feel now? And obviously, I think you'd be proud that they've come back again and it's you know it's it's thriving. Do you, do you miss not being in it? No. Uh, again, I, everyone has the moment, and at that time, it was the right time for me. I was still very active in the industry. I felt that I wanted to promote the industry and I could do it through that medium. Looking at the new series, it's done slightly different. There's probably much more drones involved. And I felt really connected to the first series because I, to a degree, got to influence the editor. So, yeah. although I didn't get, it wasn't my, my, my particular spin on it, I did... I, I didn't want it to be political. I wanted it to, to, to be true to, to life. And to a degree, I got to advise the editor would be a better way. So when there was something that I thought, mm -hmm. again, something that's nearly what we're about, could we nearly... It's more scripted now. Yeah. Whereas I, th I think editors, they're always looking to get a new dynamic and a different slant to things because when we went to series three, even the producer had changed, the editors had changed, and they, they wanted look me, they wanted to see behind the scenes of me and Irene, and that's mm -hmm. not can we feel that as our own personal space? But they I felt definitely that's really important, and I, for whatever, whatever reasons, they're probably right. But it's not where we mm -hmm. were comfortable. Uh, this, could, mm -hmm. we, could we not just film you walking along the beach hand in hand, holding hands? She looked at me and I looked at her and I says, we didn't do that, no. We're certainly not going to, to, to do something that is not our natural. No, we yeah. eventually, I think on the first series or second series, we went to a restaurant with our friends. That's something we would do. So we were kind of happy to show a side of what we might do as opposed to try and yeah. do something to make the programme look better, which is not natural to us. So there was, there was mm -hmm. boundaries, and when we said no, we meant no, but, but also, Ken, I was aware that I was also trying to promote an industry and Ken, the, the, the sector I was in. So it was getting a thing in the balance. Mm -hmm. So with what you do now, so you sold your boat, and I think that goes along the lines, if I'm right, 
goes along the lines of how you are it's about developing and seeing folk coming through the ranks and you know giving folk opportunities because without an opportunity you're not going to have new people coming through you know not everyone's got a load of bucks because a, a boat is not cheap you know contrary to what folk believe and it's not the cost of the boat it's the upkeep of the boat it's the, the expensive part you know and it was it was a young skipper that came on board and took their boat was it yeah I, I was obviously starting to prepare for my own my, the next the, the last quarter of my career which was going to be on shore as a seafood supplier but I also wanted to keep the boat going and, and can give something back to the industry. I got in getting a good start. I wanted to do the same. And there were, again, I had a, a young lad there that was working out really, really well. But you know, he was involved with his with his, his own, at that time, his own in-laws. And they seen, probably seen the potential in him as well. And they wanted him to go into business with them. And I lost a very good skipper. Now... At that point, I, I put me right back to the beginning, and again, I had to go and find another skipper, and it was just that this, this could happen again at any moment, because anyone can be attracted to another proposition, and I just felt, out of the blue, a, a young skipper who'd lost his boat only a few months previous came along to me and asked if I'd be interested in selling my boat. wasn't even on my radar, but I was very aware that it's 60 year old. When do you go? And here was someone knocking on my door saying, I want to buy your boat. And I wanted to progress the on side of my, my, uh, of the, my career. So mm. sometimes it's all about timing in life, Callum. And, and Things happen for a reason, Jimmy. We, we sometimes speak about the, the perfect storm, but this wasn't the perfect storm. This was the perfect sunset where everything was coming together at mm -hmm. the right time. And for me... Yeah. You make that decision because I always remember an old an old fisherman saying, "Ken, you'll know when the time is right, but don't don't outstay your welcome." Ken, if if there's an opportunity and it's the right one for you at the time, take it and move on. Then I live in regret because some people stay too long, things change, and then the loss out. Or Ken, but Ken, in many cases you can stick get out too quick and the industry could still be good. For me, it was perfect timing. It's what I wanted to do at the right time, so it was time to make that break. But it wasn't easy. Having a boat, yeah, because it's having a vessel that, that, dare I say... Was your life. Yes, was your life. I'm not saying you're in love with it, but that is the one thing that provides you safety and income and becomes part of you. You then mm -hmm. had to relinquish. Was, it was difficult on the day, but I've no regrets. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's like you said, you already had an outline plan of what you wanted to do after. But and if you'd left that too long, the drive and desire for that, wouldn't you wouldn't have had the energy to... You'd have rather have just taken your money, chilled out with Irene, gone for that walk holding hand along the beach that you do every week. <laughs> What what do you find are the biggest challenges that you've got right now? I think the biggest challenge would be... Oh, that is a good question. There's lots of challenges. I, growing the company, because I've got aspiration to, to, to invest in the next stage of the business, which is a wholesaler. So mm -hmm. probably having premises... That, that allows us to expand and start to, de to deliver on what my goals and aspirations are for that company. I think COVID has definitely been a challenge, but also one of my success stories. So if we go back three years ago, we were a two, three-man company. Again, three years later, we're now an eight-man company. So we've got four full-time jobs, four part-time jobs. I think that... That is not, not a challenge, but it's been a challenge to be able to grow the company under such difficult circumstances. I think well, I've got to look at the financial forecast. A cost of living crisis coming to the UK, and my, my aspiration is to grow across the UK. That is going to be different, difficult for expensive seafood. That said, 
I've, I've had a, I don't want that to, to overburden me, but it will be a challenge because some people will disengage from buying online or paying a bit extra because they've only got X amount in their purse. But I also see that there are people who can't afford that and therefore I've got to, I've got to make them my target market. So my challenge will be mm -hmm. my market will change. How do I change my offering to make sure that I can still keep some of my existing customers on board, but mm -hmm. also increase new onboard customers going forward? So this is kind of a lot down the lines of what forked up is. So like you said there about how, you know, you took advantage of COVID, right? I know it was tough. Well, really tough because it was all of a sudden, like everyone else, nothing coming in, but now you had to diversify a little bit. But, you, you know, I think you, for me, watching your business from the outside and you supply me, I, I know the, the, the troubles that you have, you know, like some of the products that you've got, your, your middleman and your... You're at the mercy of other companies, you know. You're at the mercy of other people, which is real difficult because it's not necessarily their their fault. Sometimes when there's you know lack of staff, that that's just worldwide problem at the moment. But I think I think that would be a great thing for you personally. And they always say that the best time to take an opportunity is when it's probably looks like the least likely time to do it so now is the time to strike because there will be businesses disappear the people there'll be folk that are been ready to go anyway and they'll probably think you know what now's the time so they're going to i think there's plenty of opportunity there for you but i think this would allow your your business and market to grow because you're restricted quite heavily on what you can put out when you can put it out and what the cost is Whereas if you're controlling all that yourself, the flexibility of them things all become your control. You know, it's a bit like being back as the skipper again of the boat. You know, you make the decisions based on what's right for you at that time, not what everyone else is controlling. So I, I actually think, so it's, this is kind of what I'm about. I'm about how, how do I tap you into the right ways of getting that? And that's the, like, when you start telling me that, I'm going, Ch -ch -ch -ch, you'll watch this back and you'll see my face change. And I, I think this is the right time for you, Jimmy. Personally, I think this would be your opportunity time. If you don't do it now, the markets will change. You can manipulate that market. You can take it while it's at the time that's right for you. Yeah, no, and, and I can relate that back to my days as, as a fisherman before I was a skipper. I always remember this skipper. The fisher was going through a difficult period. It always does. Every industry does. So we were going, we were at the doldrum. All the skippers were selling out. Ken, it was time for them to go. This young yeah. skipper with an old boat ordered a new boat. And I, I, you know how you listen to other people. You can sometimes be influenced by them. And all I could all I could hear was the negativity. Why on earth would he would he order a new boat just now? He'll never see it paid. That same family since then have built six new boats. And and it's it's seizing the opportunity when the time is right for you. It's not about what economically is out there. You've you've got to factor that in. But it's all about your mindset how you yeah. see the future and how you're going to set the future of uh, your future into that vision that you're setting up. So you're, so you're right. And I suppose that is so what it, is now driving me on because I feel more confident, more in control of how mm -hmm. I can go about this. Two, th two things come to me here. Um, one would be, it, it reminds me back of the t your troubled time where nothing was working, you weren't catching fish, everything's fault. It was a boat, it was the nets, the crew, it was everything. It was you. And Irene says, it's you, right? And I bet you now, she sees that frustration at home again now because all your troubles, you can't control them at the moment. You're, you know, like a prime example, you ran out of a product the other week and you said to me, I'm, I'm just waiting on it coming back in. Now I know the frustrated because you're trying to make sales, but you can't make the sales if you can't get the product, you know. Whereas if you have your own unit and you're controlling all this yourself, 
you you don't have anything to answer to. You yeah. you'll think, probably think, find the hunger for the business yeah, grows I think as well. For me it is is to have that space to, to be in better control of how I can procure, how I can store, and how I can react to the market. And to be fair, Colin, you're absolutely right. But that's part of learning the new business because as being a, a hunter gatherer is a different yeah. businessman to being a sales and procurement and sales person. Still, mm -hmm. they're both businessmen, but 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 Different, huh? differently, and you've got to think differently, and you've got to be much more. You've got to be thinking months ahead. When I was a first, well, look, look. I was only thinking weeks ahead. As, a, yeah. as, a, as an onshore supplier, I've got to be months ahead. I've got to start preparing yeah. for Christmas in August. Yeah, I was. I was going to say one of the one of the things, and you'll you'll relate to this, is we both supply compass, and we. We both were pitching for tender for products, and how different it is to. I'm I'm used to people coming into my business and buying something there and then, or the van going out. It's a quote. You accept it. You go and do it. But to be pitching for tender and doing all them things is a different ball game. You know, you've got. It's quite hard to learn, but it's quite hard to take on the chin because, look, I don't often get rejection. <laughs> get rejection. You know, it's like I. I'm not lucky. I probably pick the right things to choose, but like when you, we could have both walked away straight away with Compass instead of just getting up, going again, getting up, going again. You know, and trying to trying to make something of it. But it's a hard, hard graft. It's different to hunter gathering, isn't it? And and you're dealing. you the problem with as as a small companies is we're competing with big companies that have got much more yeah. financial clout than we have. So if they can get the numbers right, if they can get the volume, then they they can probably make money on the volume rather than, than we're trying to provide a quality product, yeah. which we're really passionate about, and we know mm -hmm. will win them business. But as procurement managers, the the, the accountant accountants run the company, and they they always see yeah. the cost saving rather than the product quality. That's the, the package. Bit that, 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 but you're right. But because we're so passionate, yes, we get a blow on the chin, and yes, we're on the canvas. But you know what? We didn't get counted out at ten. We're up at eight, and we're back on. Even though we're a little dizzy, and we're ready to go again. Ding, ding, run two. You've been dizzy a few times. You've been out with me, Jimmy. <laughs> a few, <laughs> a few, a few been like counted out. That's just that's self-inflicted. <laughs> Well, that's, that's another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what what do you think the challenges are in the future for you, Jimmy? What's going to be your biggest challenges ahead? Well, what I see as the business is growing, call it, is cash flow. Because the bigger yeah. you get, the more that you've got to give 30 days credit. And therefore, yeah. the more that creates a headache to you. So it's mm -hmm. great winning new business because that gives you more sales. But it means you've got to buy more. So if if you if someone defaults on a thirty day payment, but you've got to pay your supplier, then you're then starting to to bankroll other companies. So the mm -hmm. challenges are keeping the finances really tight, mm -hmm. but giving people a good and honest deal and saying, look, we can only do this if you can adhere to the thirty day payments. So there's a lot. Mm -hmm. These are the challenges. But I, I do see it, like, see, when we're, like, going back four years ago, it was really manageable. But now, when you're starting to rank up can we, can huge sales, then you cannot allow that to get out of hand. So, and again, we're doing all this organically. So, we've really grown the company can, in a sustainable manner. But I do see as that grows that, that we've got to keep our finger firmly on the pulse. What has been part of my success in that is, is surrounding myself with a really good team. And I think can, that's, that's back to my days again. I keep going back to being part of a crew. There was a skipper and a crew and that vessel worked like clockwork. I'm sure you've seen that in, in, in your days in the Navy. We've got mm -hmm. to replicate that onshore that you're a team and if we are contribute 
great things will happen. So it's just kind of keeping the energy and, and keeping everyone enthused, but keeping our finger, as I say, the finance of the company will, will be what it's won and lost. Yeah, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for most folk, you know, like just now. Jesus, my uh, my electric, I'm normally, I'm normally about nine grand a year for electric. I'm nearly £36,000 for electric just now. You know, it's like, it's it's mind-blowing, you know, and it's and it's like, it's not like I'm frivolous either, you know, and it's like, how do businesses, it's okay if you're busy, but if you're quiet, it's a lot of money to put out with no return, you know, it's just dead money really you know so so and, and you're right and that's where you've got to be very smart about your opening hours or yeah can, how what's what days staff are coming in so it's really in-house management good husbandry within the business mm -hmm. will also help to, to to just tweak that efficiencies that you need because to use the coin of uh, as that every little helps no, definitely. That's 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 for for sure. You know, it's. I think the hard, one of the hard things as a supplier as well, though, do you find that, you know, you've got to keep the margin there. And at, at the current time, what's quite difficult is you know you've got to keep the margin so that you can keep paying everyone, a, you know, not just a good wage, a really good wage, and to support their families. But the margins are so tight just now on food; it's unbelievable. Absolutely, and that's the one thing again that, that, that it's horrible when you lose business. But mm -hmm. I always take the comfort saying, "Well, if someone else is, can do it for less, absolutely fine." I kind of substitute the business to help you yeah. run your business. I'm providing yeah. a quality product. I stand by my quality issues. Therefore, I'm not prepared to because I've got people to pay, and can. Look, one contract I was pitch, pitching on it, we were speaking about a penny a fish. Now, no. you keep thinking, well, a penny a fish, but over hundreds of thousands of fish, that's a lot of pennies. And it starts mm -hmm. to run into to, to, to money. But at the end of the day, if, it, if, you, if this is the criteria you want, you want the MSC, you want the Scottish, you, you want the quality, then... That comes at a price, and I cannot compete with something that is processed in China, thousands of miles away. That have got a different set of rules and a different set of ethics. So we've got to, got to make sure that we're quoting business like for like. And if we're not, then ask yeah. yourself why is he so much more expensive, and where does your values lie as a, as a procurement company? Do you want to support mm -hmm. a small growing company in a local community? Or do you just want to be to, to show pounds, shillings and pence and do a bit of greenwashing as I say? And and how does like you've had great family support over the years and is you can see that's evident as well with Amnity, because the fish company, because you know, your daughters and that get involved and everyone pulls together and how is the support there? Does that give you the drive to keep going? Definitely. I mean, I think you're hitting it right, Ken. What's the one thing that makes me get up in the morning is I've got a young team. So we've, we've built this company from nothing. Mm -hmm. I've got great support from Aberdeenshire Council, from Opportunity North mm -hmm. East, from Business Gateway. Everyone has been really helpful because they've seen the passion and the enthusiasm that I've got there. But the one thing they mm -hmm. always, always, every one of them said, Jimmy, you cannot do this alone. You need to take yeah. people on board. And since just before COVID, I started to, to take on, increase the team. And now my own daughter is, is part of that team, making the company much more visible on social media which is absolutely, which is fantastic at, because people can, you are, a, you are a business, and people need to know where you're at, what you're located, what you're good at. So th that promotional side of things is really important. But it's just, that's the thing that gets me up in the morning, is I'm off into work, because there's people there that really like their job. We, although we can be very serious, and we've got to be very regimented, we must also take time to have a bit of laugh 
bring a bit of humour into the workplace and make it a place of enjoyment rather than, oh my, going to walk in there again, is, is the old grumpy drawers going to be in there? And it's sometimes, it's, it's true, but sometimes the, the, the pressures of the day can get to you. You've got procurement issues, you've got lost orders, you've, the, all of these things you've got to deal with. But it's not your mm -hmm. staff's problems. What you've got to do is make sure you're in there and make sure that you're a good boss and they want to be in there and they want to be achieving great things with you. And Colin, I have learned a lot from you because I've watched you grow the bay and how you invest it in your people in and around you. And I've replicated that using my own experience but watching you in an onshore business. It's all about the team. Yes, you can head it up. Yes, you can have the drive and the passion. But you need the support firmly behind you because you, that, when you are busy doing other things, you need to make sure that that machine is working like a Swiss watch, ticking away meticulously. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit like it's a bit like you being a skipper, but you're the only one that's going to cast the net. You're the only one that's going to take the net, and you're the only one that's going to fill it the fish. You can't do it all, you know. No. You, you you could, but you would only be going home with a little, a few boxes of fish, you know, and a headache. Yeah. So yeah, you're totally right, and it's like customer service. Like I always say, customer service is king. You know, no matter what trade or business you're in, if you can give folk great customer service, which I know you do, and that's that's kind of like what we both do in the way of you want to give them not just give them that scampi not just give them that that, that fish you're wanting to give them the experience it's they, you don't want the sale you want them to come back again and become a customer because the yeah. customer is when they repeat the business it's not the sales no use that's short term lived it's not got long term jeopardy uh, uh, prosperity in it you know you need the repeat custom and I think you are really good at that in some ways probably get drawn deep into it but that's what people buy into with you it's a story customer yeah. service is king eh? yeah absolutely without, without, without customers we have no business uh, and therefore that's why I, if I'm putting my name to it I've got to have the confidence that the product is good and if it's not I've got to accept the criticism, but I've also got to go and sort it. So getting yeah. right the first time around means you can get a returning customer. And if you've got a returning customer, you've got the basis to build a business and expand that. Because people are followers. People watch. People like to be attached to success. That's just a fact, yeah. a fact of, of life. So if you make something successful... People want to be part of that. They want to support that because they know that they're going to get an experience. No, it's as simple as again, having a fish supper. If you sat in your car outside the bay and you've just finger looking good, you're going to get that customer back. And, and that is how you've built your business is by quality, associating yourselves with the right, with the right suppliers. That's not necessarily uh -huh. me because sometimes I, I let you down. <laughs> But it's quite funny, in all the early years, there was never a failure. It's just this last year. But no, it's, it's, it's across out, the board for everything. Yeah, it's outside forces that is making mm -hmm. things difficult for us as suppliers. But at the end of the day, we try our best. I'll give you a, just as a funny remember something about us two. I'd been on at you for years and years about getting scampi for me. And you kept saying to me, well, you'll have to peel it yourself. And I'm like, fuck off, Jimmy. I'm not, who's going to stand peeling? Do you know how much scampi I sell? You're going, oh, it's all right, it's easy enough. And I'm saying, for you, it'll be the job no one wants to do. And I kept on it yet and on it yet and on it yet. And you says, I remember one day you said, Callum, I want to have my name on your board, on your digital screens. So I went up and I typed up, Jimmy Buckin, you're a wanker, or something like that. And then I sent you a screenshot of it and said, there you go, you're on the board. Now get the fucking scamp <laughs> get the scampi peeled. But you did. It's like you were trying to find the right place to get it done. And that's, that's a good while ago now, Jimmy, eh? I would think, Callum, that must be about 13 years ago. Would it be as long as that? 12, 13 years ago? Yeah. Yeah, and definitely, yeah. That. And I remember the first day, first time I delivered. You you were my first customer for Peel Scumpy. Mm -hmm. And I remember mm -hmm. in that proud moment when we actually had product, we were able to come in Put it on your menu, uh, and mm -hmm. can the, the journey's still going on. 
the, the, the only benefit now is you've got a driver that doesn't go away with two boxes of scampi and doesn't want Irene to know that he's having a sneaky scampi in his way. <laughs> Don't tell Irene. Okay. But, but, but even that, Callum, you've seen the, the growth of the company where I was doing the deliveries. But the problem is when you're doing yep. the de- deliveries, you can't be growing the company. Can, and it was that. Yeah, you can't make the sales. start to invest in a team that mm-hmm. is allowing me to, to remain in the business and drive the business forward. And, and, and yeah. the other team members supporting that that delivery service and the supply and the procurement. Mm-hmm. So you've actually seen it growing to where it is today. Well, oh, we've, even got a, we've even got a van with yours truly positioned on the back of the face. The face on the back of the van. So. Uh-huh. I know. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's caused a few image. crashes that has. It's caused Funny a few story crashes. story there. When, it, when we first got the van with, with my face brazen across the back of the van, you'd be going down the dual carriageway and you get people overtaking you, looking up to see if it's you, it's in the van or not, to see if they would toot. And you think to yourself, this is getting a dangerous situation here. I'd rather you keep your eyes on the road. I'll do the wave again. <laughs> so. Tell me, um, I've one of the things that I've been doing the past year is I've got really into audible books because um, being dyslexic, reading books is not happening, never has happened. Um, school life was terrible for me, I couldn't stand it with being dyslexic. But I've really got into audible books, I've done like 40 audible books this year. What three books would you recommend listeners to read? Do you, read, do you read books, Jimmy? I, 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 I did like reading. I, th- I think latterly I've been, just been so busy that I hadn't got the time to sit down to read. But I'm just looking across at, across the room in my man cave here and I can, I can see books on here. I've got autobiographies. I love autobiographies. I'm really interested mm-hmm. in people and how they mm-hmm. came from rags to riches. There's some great mm-hmm. stories out there. So that is my inspiration, autobiographies. Uh, but I, I'm not one for fiction, and I'm certainly not one for, for sky fi or uh, kind of futuristic stuff. So I'm a real people person. I just love reading about people uh, and, and the journeys that they've had and the challenges that they've faced because I get inspired from, from them. Barack Obama, again, he was a global leader. He did things his way. Dare I say on there, there is Margaret Thatcher. Now, people might condemn me for it, but I admire her because she did things at a time as a woman mm. when women weren't even equal in, in our society. So to take that- on the challenge that she did and do it in uh-huh. such a way, I just found her her tenacity that has never been king of much. But she was maybe just lucky at a point in a time of life that that was her moment, her time, and she was able to deliver on her terms. But it was a true politician though, wasn't she? She stood her ground and that was yeah. it. Like it or not it. Yeah, and, and that probably was what was her strength and her mantra. So I had a, good, a book in particular, but certainly autobiographies. And I, I probably I don't read enough, but when I do go on holiday, I do like to take a book, and that would be my way of switching off, is getting into a book and, and engaging in it. But maybe, you forgot maybe to, for it, your listeners, they should buy The Trollerman by Jimmy Buchan. Great author. I was a way to say Sorry. you've missed one book. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when you gave me, I remember when you gave me The Trollerman by Jimmy Buchan, and you said to me, Callum, it's like a real Mills and Boone, this is. <laughs> Mind you, most folk won't even know what Mills and Boone is. No, but it, but it is a love story, and it is about a man in the sea and all the funny things that he did. But and and yes, I'm not a, I'm not a writer per se, but the first paragraph in that book was the first bit I ever wrote. I didn't think I was a writer, but see, when I start to to, to reel off, it was just mm-hmm. flowing out the tips of my fingers, and I couldn't get enough written. And all this story started to come to life, and. So, King, there is a writer in me, although probably it's something I've never practiced. That is where my daughter Jenna, that does all the 
PR and media stuff. <laughs> I could see she gets some of the traits that I've got, but she's been trained in it, and therefore she can get it out of the brain through the tips of her finger into a computer. She did let me into a secret, a secret column. She says that after two glasses of red wine at 10 o'clock at night, it always flows much better. That made me nervous. So. Well, uh, it's, it's only if you switch your computer on and look to see what she's done, Jimmy. If you just keep it <laughs> off, just put, disable notifications, you'll be fine. She, so. it, she did want to do a promotion about shocking scallops. And uh, I just thought it was a bit too near the bone. So I had, it's the only time I had to override and says, no, not in my name. Because you can imagine where that was going about the shocking scallops. So uh, sometimes, sometimes Dad has just got to, 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 to say, oh, look, I appeal to all people, all walks of life, and I don't want to alienate myself for a misinterpretation. So, Jimmy, where, where can people buy your seafood from? Well, there's, there's a couple of easy solutions. If they are local to, to the northeast of Scotland, they can come to Peterhead, and we are located on the quayside. Uh, we're, I, I'm, I hope I'm open enough to say that we are moving to new premises within the, within the term of the year, which is going to give us much more capacity. We're looking at... Uh, having a better retail offering. So that is a work in progress. But in the short term, even if you're local or if you're in Cornwall or in Shetland or whatever, you can go online, www.amityfish.co.uk and we've got a fantastic online uh, service. But again, if there's something on there, if there's something not on there, get in touch, the phone was up, and if we, can, if we can service it, we will do it. So pretty much, if it crawls or swims in the sea, within reason, we will help you find that product. But it's not always easy, and not all things are local to Peterhead. So uh, you've... Or seasonal. Yep, you've just, got, you've just got to bear with us. But we aim to please, and we would be delighted to... Bears? Have you have bears as well? We aim to please... <laughs> But uh, no, we would be delighted to, to win at any new business, big or small, and there's an entry level for everyone. Exactly. And you're also on all the social platforms as well, Jimmy, yeah? The Instagrams, the, yes, Twitters, Facebook, you name it. LinkedIn, there's so many. The only one that I'm kind of half good at is the LinkedIn one. Uh, but no, uh, Jenna's got all these uh, other socials uh, covered. I see that they're launching a new social media platform just now. And what's it called? Yeah, they were talking. They were talking about you using you and your uh, like that that logo in the back of your car, your face. They were wanting to use that. <laughs> Where's so this think, leading? I think they're calling it. I think they're calling it twat face. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably you didn't need to launch a new new platform for that. Probably plenty of people out there already think that. But that's fine. They're entitled to their opinion. But don't knock me for Jimmy. Quiet. Jimmy, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for uh, coming on board, Fork Tucks Podcast. Um, it's been an honour. There's always more stories come out of you, even though I know half of them, but I don't know hardly any once you get going. Um, so thank you very much. Much appreciated. Cheers, buddy. Colin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.